Ladies and gentlemen, man is by nature a religious being. Being religious or having a belief in a higher power is as natural to a man as hunger or thirst. There's plenty of evidence to show that, that even left to his own devices, that man will always worship something. We have seen that when people do not know the one true God, <laughs> they'll worship just about anything that you can imagine. They'll worship the sun or the moon or the earth or some creature, some dead ancestor, uh, 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 an idol of their own making, any number of things, but people will worship something. Even among the most ignorant and primitive of jungle tribes, ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of them have some sort of a religion. And then, as part of their religion, they will practice certain religious exercises or rituals at different times of the year or for special, certain special occasions. Religion, we know, has been one of the most powerful forces in the history of the world. Think about how many millions of people have fought wars and died because of their religious convictions. And we should know that even our nation was founded by people that had a great desire to escape oppression and to worship God as they saw fit. And one of the key provisions of our Constitution is that of religious freedom. I regret to say that religious freedom in America is slowly but surely being eroded away. And if Christians don't start acting like Christians and voting like Christians, it's only a matter of time until our religious liberty is completely gone. But I asked the question this morning, why do you suppose that a man worships? Why does it appear that mankind has always been a religious being? Of course, the skeptics and unbelievers would tell us that all religion is nothing but superstition. But that doesn't answer the question, does it? That only turns the question then is why is people why are people superstitious? But as one studies the scriptures, friends, there can be no doubt that man looks to a power higher than himself because God has created us that way. Yes, God has created within each and every person that has ever lived the need that only religion can fill. The Apostle Paul spoke in Acts 17, verses 26 through 28, and he said, "And he has made, and he he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us." For in Him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are His offspring. You see, man seeks religion because God made us that way. Sure, we know a lot of people would deny it, and a lot of people live without regard to God and God's Word. But I'm telling you, you better believe that when somebody's laying there on their deathbed, their thought is going to turn to eternity, what comes after, what lies beyond. Their thoughts will surely turn to some brand of religion. Well, friends, it's imper imperative for us to realize that here in the Acts of the 17th chapter, Paul goes on to point out that religion in itself is really no good. Not all religion is valid. Real religion, religion uh, that is acceptable to God, has certain requirements to it. And we, we're taught in the Bible that there's only one true religion. We know that there's any number of false religions, religions that are totally worthless and vain, but only one true religion. And we also need to understand, my beloved, that mere religion, that is worshiping something of our own choosing, 
is worth than you is worse than you useless as far as obtaining eternal salvation is concerned. It is to no good purpose to be the most religious people in the world unless our religion is of the truth of God. It's like the Apostle Paul told those men of Athens there in Acts 17. He says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, Him I proclaim to you. You see, these folks had evidently, they were trying to cover all the bases. And they'd set up altars and false God to everything they could think of. To every... God, false God of every description, every false God of their own devising. But then the Apostle Paul comes on and he says, I'm going to teach you about the one true God and about true religion. Folks, this morning I would like for us to consider what are some of the requirements of real religion. What's real religion made up of? What are those requirements? First, Real religion requires revelation. Real religion requires revelation. You can write that down if you want to. But, folks, the simple matter, fact of the matter is we have to have guidance beyond ourselves in order to have a true and valid religion. Left to our own devices, there's no possible way that we can know God or how to approach Him. And thus, you see, there's all these pagan religions in the world. When people don't know God, they're left to devise a God of their own ideas. But ladies and gentlemen, real religion requires a a revelation from God to man. As the prophet of old said, this is Jeremiah 10, 23. He said, O Lord, I know that the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in a man who walks to direct his own steps. Man cannot possibly figure out God by himself. Think about it. How could an earthly man possibly figure out for himself an almighty heavenly God? Mankind requires a revelation from God in order for us to know God. But the good news is, folks, that God has always had some method of letting man know his, his character and his, and his will. And this has been accomplished, we know the Bible shows that this has been accomplished through different means down through the ages. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He also made the worlds. Both we ought to be so thankful today that our religion is real because it has come to us from God's own revelation. Our religion is not of man's devising, but has come down to us from God Himself. The Apostle Peter helps us to understand how God reveals Himself to man in First Peter chapter one or Second Peter chapter one. He says in verses twenty and twenty one, but know this first of all that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by the act of a human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So you see, what I'm trying to teach you is that today our revelation from God has come down to us in His Holy Word, the Bible. Because real religion requires revelation. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I here today are the most blessed people in the world in this regard. For we have been given the full and complete, comprehensive and final revelation from God to man in this Holy Word. You and I have been given unprecedented access to the Word. We have got Bibles on top of Bibles and uh, and translations upon translations. We have unprecedented access to the Word of God so that we can know 
what real religion is. We have all kind of Bibles at our disposal. God has given us everything that He saw fit for us to know and it was necessary to, for, to know about His character and His blessed will and the way to eternal life. That's why the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thir- perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, this is telling us that we now possess the complete revelation from God to man. The whole volume of instruction and encouragement has been given to us in the Holy Bible. The the Bible says we have been thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, friends, we can be confident that by following this revealed Word of God, that our religion is real. We can find great comfort by looking into the Word of God and being able to say, yes, this is what I have believed. This is what I have obeyed and will continue to obey. Friends, the only way that anybody will ever know the will of God, the character of God, is by learning what God has revealed to us in the Bible. Of course, we know the Bible also teaches us that that creation itself is sufficient proof that there is a God. But friends, only by knowing God's Word can we know about the person of God, His character, and His will for our lives. Only the Word of God keeps us from a useless and vain paganism and and a false religion. Only the Word of God reveals to us the, the blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, that came and gave His life that we might have the remission of our sins. Only through the Word of God can we know the way to everlasting life that God has promised to those that are in Christ. Praise God, He has given us the revelation of His Word because real religion requires revelation. And God has given it to us in the Bible. I'm so glad that we're not left wondering and, and merely hoping. Ladies and gentlemen, we can know because we can see God said so right here in this Word. Well, in the second place, real religion requires not only a revelation, but it requires a Redeemer. Real religion requires a Redeemer. You know, one of the things that about all religions attempt to do is to make make, uh, one a better person. And yes, and we know that even false religion can sometimes be life-changing it and make a person a different person or a better person at least in their own way of thinking. However, folks, we know or we should know that the most pressing purpose of religion is to, is to address mankind's greatest need. And that need is the problem of sin. What are we going to do about sin? You see, the Bible tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. So you see, that means we're, we're all guilty of sin, and we're all under that same penalty of death as a result of that. Our sin has separated us from God. As Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 59, 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that he will not hear. Folks, real religion has to be dealt with. Uh, has to deal with mankind's greatest need. And that need is the sole damning problem of sin. You know, this is a terrible dilemma that everybody on the planet Earth is faced with. Again, we, we've all sinned. We are, we're, we're guilty of that. And we know the penalty for that is eternal, eternal death, eternal damnation. And this would paint an awfully bleak picture if the story ended right there. But, folks, here again, we thank God that the story doesn't end there. We thank God that we're not left in hopelessness and dread and misery because God has given us a Savior. There's the good news that Jesus has come to redeem us from our sins. Again, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ladies and gentlemen, no one believing in Jesus Christ should perish, but have everlasting life. Because God has sent us a Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took upon Himself the due punishment for our sins that we've committed. Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died in our place that we can be forgiven and brought back to God. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Well, we know that even false religion can change a person's life and, and it can make all, do all kinds of things on the surface. But only through Jesus Christ, only through our Redeemer is mankind's greatest need met. Only through Christ can the soul-damning condition of sin find an answer. Real religion requires a Redeemer and Jesus Christ has come to redeem us from our sin. In the third place, real religion requires repentance. That's your third R. Real religion requires repentance. You see, since we realize that we're guilty of sin, there's a need to change our way of thinking and our way of living. This determination, this decision that we make to move our lives in the direction away from sin and toward godliness, we call repentance. Real religion requires repentance. As Jesus said in Luke thirteen three, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Look, well, I don't think it takes a genius to understand here that if we expect our sins to be forgiven, we have to repent. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all perish. Repentance means that we do not continue to live in willful sin, rebellion, or disregard to God's Word. Repentance means that we, we have to turn away from all sin, and with God's help we move our lives in the direction of righteousness. Repentance means the turning our backs on the wrong that we have done, and with the resolve that we're going to move our lives to honor and obey the Word of God. Repentance is essential for salvation. When the gospel was first preached there on the day of Pentecost, and those people that were convicted of their sins asked the, uh, Peter and the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? By divine inspiration, the apostle Peter gave the answer, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. You see, God gave the answer to sins. Repent and be baptized. We need to know the Bible teaches that Jesus came to save people from their sins, not in their sins, Matthew one twenty one. And there's a world of difference. But it means, folks, that people... We must be willing to repent and turn away from our sins if we would be saved. Any religion that would teach, uh, that would fail to teach the essentiality of repentance is a false religion. It is a vain religion. It is a religion that cannot possibly save. But you know, there seems to be this, you know, you've heard it so many times as, as much as I have. There's this, Growing popular lie that God's grace will somehow cover everybody's sin regardless. There's no real need to worry about, you know, living in sin. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, after all, God's a loving God, and we'll just do a few good deeds and pray once in a while, everything will be fine in the end. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's a lie. That's a soul damning lie. One cannot continue to live in sin, in, in practice of sin, and be saved. The Bible teaches that everybody has to repent. Acts 17.30, And truly this time of ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That leaves out nobody. 
First Peter, Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Friends, if we fail to repent of our sins, then we've missed the reason Jesus. One of the reasons Jesus came into the world, because Jesus said that one of the reasons He came was to call sinners to repentance. And since you're a sinner, guess what? You need to repent. Matthew nine thirteen. But again, you might be the most religious person in the country. But if your religion is without repentance, then quite simply, your religion is not worth a hill of beans. Because religion without repentance is no religion at all. Because make no mistake about it, real religion requires repentance. We're well, going on in the fourth place this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that real religion requires regeneration. Real religion requires regeneration. Paul wrote of our salvation, our redemption, in these words in Titus 3, 5. He says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by... This is the means, this is the method to use by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. By the washing of regeneration. Regeneration, folks, that word just simply means to give new life. It means to be born again. That ought to remind us of what Jesus said in, in John the third chapter. Remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, what he told him. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Jesus went on in verse 5 to clarify what he meant by being born again when he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You see, being born again involves two things, according to Jesus, water and Spirit. Friends, if we can trust that Jesus knew what He's talking about, then water and Spirit are the elements of regeneration, of being born again. I think it's obvious, it's obvious to me, and I think it's obvious to a lot of the world, that many people that claim to be born-again Christians have never been born again at all. And their manner of living proves it. And that's because so much of the so-called Christian world today had just simply rejected the biblical means of regeneration. It seems that most people would rather trust in their own method of regeneration than to simply believe what the Bible plainly says and practice the method of regeneration that were given in the Bible. The Apostle Paul explained it this way in writing to the Romans. He said in Romans chapter 6, he says, Know you not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we were buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See what he's teaching there? After we have been baptized into Christ, the old man of sin buried. We're raised up to walk in newness of life. Folks, that's regeneration. That's being born again. And so I think we should understand, brethren, if we have not submitted ourselves to the biblical means of regeneration, then how is it possible that we could be born again? How is it possible that we could be saved? How could it be possible that we could enter the kingdom of God? We can't do it according to Jesus Christ. That's what he said. You know, we know that many today are being told all you need to do is pray and invite Jesus into your heart. Well, that sounds good enough. That sounds uh, real religious. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible doesn't teach any such doctrine as that. No one has ever been saved in the New Testament was told to pray and invite Jesus into their heart. That is a false doctrine. The Bible declares, uh, again, in 1 John 5, Verses 7 through 9. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, 
the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which He has testified of His Son. So, you see, the question is, shall we receive the witness of fallible men, or shall we receive the witness of God? Folk, do not be deceived. Real religion requires regeneration. Regeneration demands that we submit ourselves to baptism into Christ for the remission of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, these agree in one. Well, finally this morning, we need to understand that real religion also requires righteousness. Now, I know this concept has totally gone out of fashion today. You know, usually when... When, when we call for, uh, for righteousness, people who live righteously nowadays were usually accused of, of being a legalist or trying to earn our salvation. And you know, the devil hates the concept of righteousness, and so he throws up these, folk, these smoke screens. And there seems to be a winking at sin today. Excuses made for people to continue to live however they want to without regard to God's Word. Don't worry about that, living right. Everything will be fine in the end. You can still be saved. Folks, that's a false, that's a lie. If you're not living righteously, then you don't have real religion. The person that has real religion, the person that is a Christian, understands the Bible teaches, for example, in Romans 6, verses 17 and 18, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You see, ladies and gentlemen, that is real religion. Obeying the gospel, being set free from sin, to live righteously. In fact, the Bible shows that our practice of righteousness is the proof that we've been born again. 1 John 2.29 declares, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Ladies and gentlemen, if we have not been born again, if we're not re regenerated, we're not saved. And the, our practice of righteousness is one of the proofs that we've been born again. But I believe the man was right that once said, the truth of this is everywhere taught in the Bible and is worthy of being often repeated. No one who is not, in the proper sense of the term, a righteous man can have any well-founded pretensions to being regarded as a child of God. And I said, Amen. Friends, the Bible would teach us that if we are not practicing righteousness, if we are not trying to move our lives in that direction, then we should understand the Bible shows that the face of God is against us, and He will not even hear our prayers. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers, the righteous. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Folk, I think we also need to understand that this concept of righteousness is not beyond our ability to understand or to practice. It simply means that we observe God's divine laws. It means that we're sincerely striving to keep God's commandments. It means that we're allowing the Word of God to be the ruling guide for our lives, that we're trying to honor God and, and be pleasing to Him. It means that we shun the wrong and we do the right. But again, friends, do not be deceived. Any religion that does not include the practice of righteousness is not a real or valid religion. That's because real religion requires righteousness. Well, I tell you, I'd hate to think of all the false religions that man has come up with down through the ages and still coming up with today. And also, we've seen imposters and false prophets that have become multimillionaires, preaching a feel-good, health and wealth, no requirements type of lie. But, ladies and gentlemen, real religion has certain requirements. Real religion requires revelation. 
and God has given it to us here in the Bible. We have no excuse. Real religion requires revelation. Real religion requires a Redeemer. And thank God that Jesus came and gave His life on the cross that we could be redeemed. Real religion requires repentance. That's up to you and me. That's our decision that we have to make. Are we going to do what's right or are we going to continue in the path of, of rebellion against God? Real religion requires repentance. Real religion also requires regeneration. Regeneration means being born again, born of water and the Spirit, as Jesus said. And He clarified that in Mark sixteen sixteen when He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And finally, we said that real religion requires righteousness. You know, many like to leave this one off because, you know, if we make it a one-time thing and get baptized and we're saved and we're done, but no, friends, real religion, that's only, that's only when we're born. Then we continue to walk in faith and obedience to God's Word. And so I ask you today, do you have real religion? Now, there's all kinds of people that have religion. But I want to know if you have true religion. Have you met the requirements that God gives, the Word of God gives to have real religion? Well, only in real religion do we have, do we obtain the forgiveness of our sins and know the promise of eternal life in heaven. No false religion, I don't care how sincerely you believe it or how sincerely you practice it, is going to save the first soul. Nobody can be saved practicing or believing a false religion. But friends, I would admonish you today, submit yourself to the Word of God. Give yourself to the one true religion whose end is eternal life in heaven. You can make that decision today by believing in Jesus, by repenting of your sins, confessing your belief before the brethren here, and being born again, being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin in the gift of the Holy Spirit, born of the water and the Spirit, if you've not made that decision, step forward as we sing our invitation song today.